So we are at 20 years of behavioral safety now. That's really, really cool. For those of you that are new to the field, there is nothing like this. The folks that you've seen on this stage are the folks that started behavioral safety. I can remember, uh, say, 25-ish years ago, I was in, finished high school and was deciding what I wanted to do with my life. And so I thought, all right, you know what, I'll go to college. Didn't really have a feel of where I wanted to go with it, but I went to Florida State. That's where my friends were going, so that's where I went. And I took a variety of classes. Took some psychology classes and thought, all right, this is kind of interesting, but I wasn't completely there. Then I signed up for a course, Introduction to Behavior Analysis. Wow. I was only in that class probably for about a week before I thought, this is it. This is what I want to do. This stuff is important. This stuff works. This stuff changes lives. I want to be a part of this. So I kind of became the grad school groupie. And I would help the grad st graduate students with their research and got them to invite me along to conferences. And this was before this venue was even around. And I had this amazing professor, uh, his name was uh, Dr. John Bailey. And he had a whole series, you know, it was a really great behavioral program at Florida State. And when you went through his program, he would make you do this pledge. We literally had to stand there, raise our hand, and say, I will make a difference. And I think every single class that we took, <laughs> about once a week, I will make a difference. And so the folks that are here this week have made a difference. They've done some really amazing stuff. So I'm really honored to be able to share a stage with them. Now, these folks really are leaders in this field. But let me ask you something. How many of you guys sitting out here, raise your hand, how many would call yourself a leader? All right, quite a few. Wonderful. For those of you that didn't raise your hand, I'm going to challenge you to rethink how you define leadership. Let's take a look at this. How many of you are completely comfortable with calling yourselves a leader? See, I've asked that question all the way across the country, and everywhere I ask it, no matter where, there's always a huge portion of the audience that won't put up their hand. And I've come to realize that we have made leadership into something bigger than us. We made it into something beyond us. We made it about changing the world. And we've taken this title of leader, and we treat it as if it's something that one day we're going to deserve. But to give it to ourselves right now means a level of arrogance or cockiness that we're not comfortable with. And I worry sometimes that we spend so much time celebrating amazing things that hardly anybody can do that we've convinced ourselves that those are the only things we're celebrating. And we start to devalue the things that we can do every day. And we start to take moments where we truly are a leader and we don't let ourselves take credit for it and we don't let ourselves feel good about it. And I've been lucky enough over the last 10 years to work with some amazing people who have helped me redefine leadership in a way that I think has made me happier. And with my short time today, I just want to share with you the one story that is probably most re responsible for that redefinition. I went to a school in a little school called Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. And on my last day there, a girl came up to me and she said, I remember the first time that I met you. And then she told me a story that happened four years earlier. She said, on my day before I started university, I was in the hotel room with my mom and my dad, and I was so scared and so convinced that I couldn't do this, that I wasn't ready for university, that I just burst into tears. And my mom and my dad were amazing. They were like, look, we know you're scared, but let's just go tomorrow. Let's go to the first day, and if at any point you feel as if you can't do this, that's fine. Just tell us. We will take you home. We love you no matter what. And she said, so I went the next day, and I was standing in line getting ready for registration, and I looked around, and I just knew I couldn't do it. I knew I wasn't ready. I knew I had to quit. And she says, I made that decision, and as soon as I made it, there was this incredible feeling of peace that came over me. And I turned to my mom and my dad to tell them that we needed to go home. And just at that moment, you came out of the student union building wearing the stupidest hat I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was awesome. And you had a big sign uh, promoting Shiner M, which is Students Fighting Cystic Fibrosis, a charity I've worked with for years. And you had a bucket full of lollipops. And you were walking along, and you were handing the lollipops out to people in line and talking about Shiner Emma. And all of a sudden, you got to me, and you just stopped, and you stared. It was creepy. <laughs> 
This girl right here knows exactly what I'm talking about. And then you looked at the guy next to me, and you smiled, and you reached in your bucket, you pulled out a lollipop, and you held it out to him, and you said, you need to give a lollipop to the beautiful woman standing next to you. And she said, I have never seen anyone get more embarrassed faster in my life. He turned beet red, and he wouldn't even look at me, he just kind of held the lollipop out like this. And I felt so bad for this dude that I took the lollipop. And as soon as I did, you got this incredibly severe look on your face and you looked at my mom and my dad and you said, look at that, look at that. First day away from home and already she's taking candy from a stranger. <laughs> and she said, everybody lost it. 20 feet in every direction, everyone started to howl. And I know this is cheesy and I don't know why I'm telling you this. But in that moment when everyone was laughing, I knew that I shouldn't quit. I knew that I was where I was supposed to be and I knew that I was home. And I haven't spoken to you once in the four years since that day, but I heard that you were leaving. And I had to come up and tell you that you've been an incredibly important person in my life, and I'm gonna miss you. Good luck. And she walks away, and I'm flattened. And she gets about six feet away, she turns around and smiles and goes, you should probably know this too. I'm still dating that guy four years later. <laughs> a year and a half after I moved to Toronto, I got an invitation to their wedding. Here's the kicker, I don't remember that. I have no recollection of that moment, and I've searched my memory banks because that is funny, and I should remember doing it, and I don't remember it. And that was such an eye-opening, transformative moment for me to think that the, maybe the biggest impact I'd ever had on anyone's life, a moment that had a, a woman walk up to a stranger four years later and say, you've been an incredibly important person in my life, was a moment that I didn't even remember. How many of you guys have a lollipop moment, a moment where someone said something or did something that you feel fundamentally made your life better? All right. How many of you have told that person they did it? See, why not? We celebrate birthdays where all you have to do is not die for 365 days. <laughs> and yet we let people who have made our lives better walk around without knowing it. And every single one of you, every single one of you has been the catalyst for a lollipop moment. You have made someone's life better by something that you said or that you did. And if you think you haven't, think about all the hands that didn't go back up when I asked that question. You're just one of the people who hasn't been told. But it is so scary to think of ourselves as that powerful. It can be frightening to think that we can matter that much to other people. Because as long as we make leadership something bigger than us, as long as we keep leadership something beyond us, as long as we make it about changing the world, we give ourselves an excuse not to expect it every day from ourselves and from each other. Marianne Williamson said, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that frightens us. And my call to action today is that we need to get over that. We need to get over our fear of how extraordinarily powerful we can be in each other's lives. We need to get over it so we can move beyond it. And our little brothers and our little sisters, and one day our kids, or our kids right now, can watch us start to value the impact we can have on each other's lives more than money and power and titles and influence. We need to redefine leadership as being about lollipop moments. How many of them we create, how many of them we acknowledge, how many of them we pay forward, and how many of them we say thank you for. Because we've made leadership about changing the world, and there is no world. There's only six billion understandings of it. And if you change one person's understanding of it, one person's understanding of what they're capable of, one person's understanding of how much people care about them, one person's understanding of how powerful an agent for change they can be in this world, you change the whole thing. And if we can change, understand leadership like that, I think if we can redefine leadership like that, I think we can change everything. And it's a simple idea but I don't think it's a small one. And I want to thank you all so much for letting me share it with you today. I love that. Leadership isn't about changing the world. It's about impacting lives. Leadership isn't about changing the world. It's about impacting lives. I think that's incredibly powerful. Because we look at the folks, you know, especially those that were on the stage yesterday and Julie, and think, wow, these people are these great leaders, and they've built these companies and started new fields and new services, and we make it bigger than ourselves, when each and every one of us has the power to make an amazing impact. You know, he asked in the video of, of people that have impacted your lives, and one person that I can think of that's impacted my lives introduced me today. So we had the, the brilliant and fabulous Dr. Grania Matthews who introduced me. And those of you that know her know she is brilliant and fabulous. But I met her about 20 years ago. And at that time, she was still brilliant and fabulous, but she was just Grania. Um, I call her G, that's my, my name for her. And we were both graduate students. She was in the PhD program. I was in the master's program at uh, Western Michigan. And we didn't really know each other. We were at different points in our academic careers. So we didn't necessarily really even have classes together. But there was a mutual respect and appreciation. So Grania comes up to me one day 
and says, you know what, Angelica? We're both at this point where we're supposed to be working on our thesis or a dissertation project. And as anyone knows, if you've ever done a project like that, where you know, it might take you a year or two to get this thing done, there is very little reinforcement that goes on <laughs> when you're working on these kind of projects. So it's really easy to procrastinate. It's really easy to make this last way longer than it should. So Grania has this brilliant idea. She says, okay, well, we're, we're calling ourselves behavior analysts here. So how about we meet on Sundays and we will do behavioral contracting. We'll make goals and specific things that we're gonna get done for the following, you know, over the following week. And then when we meet the next Sunday, we'll have our coffee and we have to be accountable to each other. Three years later, we were still meeting for coffee every single Sunday. So I've learned an amazing amount from her and, and she's a friend and a mentor and you know, a therapist at times. We, about two years ago, I guess, we went to Costa Rica. So we're in this quest for knowledge. We thought, all right, we're gonna go and we're gonna learn how to speak Spanish. And while we're at it, we're gonna learn how to surf. Okay. I didn't have a skill there. Grania actually got up in a couple of tries. She was able to get up. Um, I gave up and went and did yoga or something. So we go on this vacation. And they, besides the surfing and the yoga and the Spanish lessons, they set up a trip. If you were staying at this hotel, you could go zip lining. We go on this trip. Now here's a, a secret about me not a lot of people know. I hate heights. It's not like a little bit of hate, it's a lot of hate. And I'm, I'm pausing, I'm kind of hesitant here to admit this in a room where there's a whole lot of psychologists. But not only do I hate heights, but I also forget that I hate heights. <laughs> so I'm the person that says, oh yeah, I'll go skydiving. Oh yeah, I'll go horseback riding on the top of a volcano. Oh yeah, a trapeze school. That was another one that I did. That seemed like a really great idea. Zip lining, oh yeah, no problem. Well, it's not zip lining you know, at this height here, it's zip lining in the canopy of a rainforest. So, but I'm a trooper, right? And, and they've got protective gear, and, and so I'm thinking that this should work. And I manage my comfort, and you know, and I'm using my techniques to calm myself as we're going from tree to tree. There's about 12 different zip lines we have to do. And then this happens. In my head, it probably looked worse than this, but this isn't really that far off. <laughs> now, I'm pretty proud of myself at this point, right? I mean, I've got this fear of heights. I'm, I'm you know, the heart starts beating fast. You feel shaky and, and sweaty. And, but I'm getting through, I'm getting through these zip lines. But this was just like, you know, a, you know, a test. <laughs> it was a test. So, all right, I can, I can manage this. So Grania, being the dear friend that she is, she goes across, she clears the bridge. And there's a group that's, you know, a couple trees behind. I know they're coming up, but there's still a distance. So I let everybody go through. And the, the guy, the guy that works there, he is trying to push me forward. And I say, no, no, no. I have this fear, but if the bridge is clear, I'll work through it and you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get across this bridge. Great, so he waits. I go and, and you know, take a deep breath. I start across this bridge, no problem. You know, but if you imagine with this thing, if you've ever been on one of these bridges, every step, this thing starts moving. I'm about halfway across. Grania's staying with me and she's like, yeah, you can do it. All of a sudden, the bridge is just bouncing back and forth crazy. Now, my center of gravity needs to be moving this way. So I'm not about to turn around to see what's going on. But I'm yelling over my shoulder to stop it. So not happy, but I make it. We get through, we go on, we see this beautiful waterfall, there were monkeys, it was a lovely day. Later on, we get rid of our gear, we're getting in the van on the way back to the hotel. And I say, Grania, what the heck happened back there? I thought, the, you know, I thought that group was farther behind me. Why was the bridge shaking so much? And she says, oh, it wasn't the group. It was the guy the, uh, that worked there, the attendant. And I'm horrified by this, right? I asked the guy. I gave him a nice, very clear antecedent. I said, please let me go through. I have this fear of heights. And she kind of like, nope. She's like, he sat there and was jumping up and down and, and with just like a maniacal grin, kind of like this. And it's worse, it's actually worse, because every time that I would scream over, 
Grani is telling me, he's just jumping more. <laughs> so I'm completely horrified by this. And, and I said, well, you know, there was a lot of, of different trees that we were on, a lot of guys that were working with us. And I said, well, which one was it? I'll never forget this. She looks straight at me, gives, gives me this smirk, and she goes, the guy that you tipped. So <laughs> the lesson here, one is, is you know, know where your fears are and don't keep signing up for things that, that cause you such, such uh, trouble, but it's also define what behaviors that you're interested in. I just reinforced the heck out of that guy being a, being a jerk, <laughs> I mean, for lack of a better word here. I, mean, I cannot even imagine the next person that came along that had a similar fear that, tell, that tells this guy, oh, you know, let me go across on my own. I mean, he's going to start just swinging that thing even more. So basic lesson here. We always want to define what we're talking about. Want to define what we're talking about. Because otherwise, you may end up with stuff that you didn't plan. Now, this conference is about behavioral safety. And you know, in that video, he, he mentions how leadership's not about changing the world. It's about impacting lives. The key word with this conference here is safety. I can't think of anything else in the workplace that has more of a potential to impact lives than safety, right? I mean, that's a biggie. You want to be able to leave work in the same condition that you came in. You want to be able to get back to your family and your friend and your community and your churches and whatever you're involved in. So safety is really important. So what is it? I love uh, Google. You can find anything, it seems like. So what does OSHA say safety culture is? Because that's the big thing we've heard here by lots of speakers. We're interested in safety culture. Well, according to OSHA, safety culture consists of shared beliefs, practices, and attitudes that exist in an establishment. Culture is the atmosphere created by those beliefs, atti attitudes, etc., which shape our behavior. Everybody clear on what culture is? Well, let's see what the UK does any better. The UK Health and Safety Commission, they say that the product of individual and group values, attitudes, perceptions, competencies, and patterns of behavior, so on and so forth, and they th even throw in the word proficiency. That's not really any more helpful. So, of course, you go to old Wikipedia. That should be a more simple approach. According to them, safety culture is the ways in which safety is managed in the workplace and often reflects the attitude, beliefs, perceptions, and values that employees share. This makes sense to everybody? Are we all clear on exactly what safety culture is? Anybody? Well, it's kind of vague, right? What is a belief? What is a value? Perceptions. They sound good, but when you start saying, well, what does that mean? It gets a little tougher. We don't have a real good definition. So, after I got you know, Googled out there, I thought, all right, well, I'll try Amazon. I bet you people have written stuff on it. How many books do you think there are on safety culture? Take a guess. Thousand? All right, sorry, having technical difficulties. Survey actually says there were 6,639 books. That's a lot of books, and I don't know about you, but I don't really have the time to be reading 6,639 books. I did skim through them, though, and some of the descriptions, and it was a lot of the same things, attitudes, beliefs, perceptions, values, all of that good stuff. So I was kind of at a loss. So we start thinking about, your piece is going to kill me, what is it? Well, when I go into organizations, there's a few things that I look at and identify, all right, that is a good indicator of a good safety culture. The first is that people are having meaningful safety conversations. They're talking about safety, and it could be spontaneous, formal, informal, but the point is that they're having meaningful safety conversations, and they're conveying that they care about safety. So we have these meaningful safety conversations. The second thing is that people are taking responsibility for their, self, for their self and for other people. So you see people taking that risk and, and stepping out and offering help, asking for help, making suggestions, coming up with solutions for things that are getting in the way of people being able to be safe. That's another thing you see in a really great safety culture. The third thing that you see 
is that the organization is really good at utilizing knowledge and experience from all levels of the organization. It's not just the, you know, the, the person over in the safety department or leadership that's responsible and, and coming up with ideas and, and, and talking about this stuff. It's, it's everybody. Everybody has an opportunity to have an input into, the, into what's going on with safety and identify issues and work with leadership to come up with solutions. And employees also know that folks in leadership positions appreciate their input and will support improvement efforts. So that's another thing. You also see in really good safety cultures proactive solutions. They're not waiting for somebody to get hurt to do something about safety. They're looking for areas where there can be improvements can be made and they're coming up with solutions when they see it. They're not waiting, they're not putting it back. And not only are they coming up with proactive solutions to existing issues, but safety is an integral part of the decision-making process. There's meaningful conversations around that. So if there are new processes or new procedures or new equipment, and, and there's being you know, brainstorming and decision-making around that kind of, of thing, safety is considered at that point. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard after the fact of there's a brand new thing and oh, well, we didn't think about that. And they're creating a safety issue with a brand new thing where it could have been engineered out if, they, if somebody would have thought about it. So there's proactive solutions for existing things as well as safety being integral to decision making. And then last but not least, in a really good safety culture, it's not about merely compliance. You know, those of you that aren't familiar with this chart, you know, this shows that if you rely solely on negative consequences in order to get people to do what you want, you're just going to get that minimum level of performance. People do just enough to avoid getting in trouble. But all the things I just talked about, all the characteristics of a great safety culture, that's all above and beyond stuff, right? That's people taking that step up and saying, all right, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to be part of teams. I'm going to do all of that. That's all above and beyond. If you want people to do that, there's got to be positive feedback built in for it. And in really great safety cultures where you have this positive management approach, people aren't afraid to report injuries or near misses. They're not afraid that they're going to get in trouble. Incidents and near misses are, learn, are looked at as opportunities to learn and to do better in the future. So when you put all of these together, you can move beyond that really generic perceptions, beliefs, values, definition of safety culture into real things that you can actually see. So you're moving more into the behavioral realm. So we can all probably pretty, agree, pretty much agree on what a decent safety culture looks like. Where it gets a little tougher is, how do you get there? This cartoon right here shows these two guys with these goofy hats, and it says, I don't know how it started either. All I know is that it's part of our corporate culture. So we can define what a good, what a good safety culture looks like, but getting there is the, is the tricky part. But the good news is, is behavior-based safety, behavioral science is really good at changing behavior. We know how to do this. All of those things I just discussed, they're, they're types of behavior. And the field of behavior analysis is really good at improving behavior. So we can do this. And with BBS, you create the environment that supports the desired behaviors. That's what it's all about. And there's a few elements of behavior-based safety that can transform your culture from where you are to where you want to be. And one of the things with BBS is that Folks get fixated on that checklist, right? And they think, all right, if you have a checklist, you have BBS. But that's just the itty bitty piece of it. That's not going to transform your culture. Where the culture change comes in is by systematically applying what we know about behavior to the issue of safety. So let's take a look at these. The first is observation and feedback. So somebody's going out, they're, having a, they're doing an observation, and then they're having a meaningful conversation about safety. They're just, if there's barriers to people being able to be safe, they talk about it. Okay, there's a collaboration coming up with proactive solutions. And it's based on giving positive feedback. Right? You don't get more positive management than that. The second part is the safety action plans. 
So this is where you're taking that information from the observations and removing the barriers to safe behavior. You have folks in a team collaborating together, leadership and frontline employees, to remove these barriers. And last but not least, leadership support. I think it was Aubrey yesterday, or, or actually a couple of the speakers mentioned it. Without leadership support, none of this happens. And the thing with BBS is that people tend to think, okay, there, it's these mechanics, it's this program, and if you do have a team and you have some safety action plans and you have a checklist and you do some observations, boom, you're gonna change your culture. That's not quite how it works. All, if you think about it, all of these things are ways of practicing these key behaviors. You know, if you say in a, in a really great safety culture, you have people going out and having meaningful safety conversations, all these elements of behavior-based safety provide a forum for that to happen and for people to get good at it. So what you end up seeing over time is that people will start having these conversations, start coming up with solutions, start giving positive feedback outside of doing BBS. All of the, these mechanics that you see up here, they're a way to get people skilled at it and doing it when they're not you know, doing BBS, when they're, when they're moving beyond. And that's where you get the culture change, where it comes in. The next point is to stick with it. I was talking uh, to Corky at Kinder Morgan. He was one of the guys yesterday that stood up and uh, because they had a program that was over 20 years. Uh, QSE worked with them 23 years ago and put in a behavioral safety process. So we're chatting and I asked him, I said, well, what's it been like over 20 years? That's a really long time. And he had the best analogy and, and I'm gonna say, I warned him yesterday, I was gonna steal it and share it with you guys. He said, you know what? He goes, it's kind of like a roller coaster. You know how when you're riding a roller coaster and you want, you're getting up to that, that big cool ride where you're gonna do the big loop-de-loop -loop down? Getting up there, it's kind of like clunk, 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 clunk. You gotta work a little to get to that point. And then you can ride it a while, but then sometimes things change, new people come in, whatever it is, and there's times where you might have to go up another hill again. But if you keep sticking with it, it works. So that's my advice to you guys. We know the science behind behavior-based safety works. It's like gravity, like they mentioned yesterday. It works. There is no debate about that. Where things get screwy is in the application of it. Okay. But if you stick it out and you stay true to your core, it'll work. It'll happen. I started today with a video, and it talked about how leadership isn't about changing the world. It's about impacting lives. My challenge to you is a couple of things. One, think of somebody that impacted you and go tell them. We need to go give a little feedback to the people in our lives. And the other thing is to identify something that you got from this conference. You know, I was really, uh, when I was asked to do this workshop, or this keynote, I had two parts of my brain going on. On one hand, I thought, oh, wow, cool, what an honor. I get to share a stage with my heroes. Okay, these are people that had a huge impact on my life, and I get to share a stage with them. That's pretty awesome. But then I thought, oh, my goodness, I have to share a stage with these people. Then I heard my time slot, slot and I'm the last keynote. And I thought, oh, great, thanks a lot. <laughs> Not only do I have to share a stage with these people that I look at as gods, but I have to go after them? Are you serious? But then I, you know, I checked myself and, and I realized, you know what? I've got a really cool opportunity here. I have the last shot at you. And my comment to you guys is I would love to see you take something that you learned here. I mean, this is a really cool conference. You've got 20 years history of people that started this field. You've got thought leaders and consultants and academics and people that are living and breathing and championing BBS here. And you get to hear from all of them. So my, my goal and my, my hope for you guys is that you take something that you learned here, go out and implement it. Could be from me, it could be from anybody else, but go take something this, that you've learned over the last few days. Go back to your homes, to your workplaces, your families, Whatever, just take one thing.
and go do it, go make a difference, and impact lives. And I'll leave you with my favorite quote, which is, to love what you do and know that it matters. What could be more fun than that? Thank you. Mm -hmm.